And also Leonard Eisenberg from 20 years ago. Oh my God. Radio Man. Uh, was a photographer back in 1969. Well, you have, can we go to that before shot again? What do you got, a picture aging in a closet somewhere? Really? <laughs> you haven't changed all that much, Leonard. Uh, went to the concert to get some pictures of Jimi Hendrix performing. We'll take a look at some of his pictures in just a few moments. Chris and Leonard and, and all of other, other guests, let me uh, throw this question your way, because as I was getting these uh, semi-hostile calls this morning on the radio about Woodstock, a lot of people were saying, you know, all this was was a sex and drug orgy. That's all it was. That's, you know, all this stuff. I mean, let's, well, I know you're shaking your heads, but a lot of that was, yes, now you're shaking your heads. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, was that, was that a dominant thing there, do you think? Or? Well, I went, I went because I was working in the radio, even though it was a college station, it was non, there were no commercials or anything. But I was going because when I saw the list of people that were playing, I could not miss that show because I was really into the music. So I was, my, my idea of what Woodstock would be would be uh, in the most incredible rock concert I ever could imagine going to. Mm -hmm. And ever since seeing the Beatles in uh, the early 60s at Boston Garden, I just felt that if there was some music happening that I thought was worth going to see, I would go see it. So all that other stuff that happened, I, I believe the people that really got involved in the drugs and the sex stuff, they were not in the crowd listening to the music. And most of the people were, were listening to the Some of them were up on the stage performing uh, in, in a lot of cases. We're here. This is, uh, look at that was the, uh, that was the view over my shoulder, uh -huh. actually. Um, I had brought a, a, a knicker mat with me with a Nikon lens on it, and I, I had very little film with me, and I, uh, that was a documentation of where I was sitting. I always like to document uh, shows that I went to because, I mean, there was no way to make any money out of doing it, but I felt it was important. Let's go to the next one, then I want to get a sense of what you were feeling as you were. Here's, uh, here's Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I had saved my film. I had two, three rolls of film all together. I spent one on uh, um, 10 years after, Saturday night stuff, and then I saved one role for Jimi Hendrix. They said he might not show up, but I was going to save the role mm -hmm. because to me he was, uh, he, to me he was the most, I mean, I would have gone if he was the only person playing. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be anybody else, so I saved it uh, just for him. Did the music live up to expectations? <coughs> Definitely. By and large. Yes. I mean, the stories, you, yes. in, in, reading, in reading your book, John Sebastian was uh, strung out on drugs. Janis Joplin was strung out on, ju on drugs. Uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, that Rabbi was Shankar was uh, absolutely wasted for, for a while. I mean, it doesn't sound like it, they were the conditions that would bring forth memorable music. Well, that was the, the way you did things in 1969, and it mm -hmm. wasn't some of the best performances. Some people, uh, Jerry Garcia, The Grateful Dead, has been widely quoted. Did the music live up to expectations? <laughs> Definitely. By and large. Yes. I mean, the stories, you, yes. in, in, reading, in reading your book, John Sebastian was uh, strung out on drugs. Janis Joplin was strung out on, ju on drugs. Uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, that Rabbi was Shankar was uh, absolutely wasted for, <laughs> for a while. I mean, it doesn't sound like it, they were the conditions that would bring forth memorable music. Well, that was the, the way you did things in 1969, and it mm -hmm. wasn't some of the best performances. Some people, uh, Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead, has been widely quoted as saying, we were terrible at here. In 1962, I started getting into photography. My cousin was working for Time Magazine at the time, and he was shooting, or I should say, photographing John Kennedy all the time. And this inspired me not to get into politics, but to extend into rock and roll. Jimi Hendrix, 1968, in Boston Garden. I was really into photography. I wanted to get closer and closer and closer. So I went to Woodstock, and this picture behind me is the Woodstock Festival. This is Jimmy beginning the set. He's starting to tune up his guitar. There are people sleeping. It's been three days, and we haven't slept yet. But I stayed till the very, very end. And in 1994, I published this picture that I took in 1969. I waited 25 years. I was a photographer. I am a photographer now, and I will do a shoot, a photo shoot, a commercial photo shoot of a fashion model in the day in the life. And as we get ready for the 40th anniversary tomorrow, iReporters who attended Woodstock have been sharing their photos from the music festival on iReport.com. And we've been talking to many of them about their memories of that event. One of those is iReporter Lenny Eisenberg, and he joins us now via Skype to talk about that experience. Lenny, I see that you are appropriately dressed to speak to us about uh, the man on your t-shirt. Uh, yeah, actually this is from one of the shots that I took that day. Uh, it was August 18th, the day after the concert was supposed to be over, August 18th, 1969. 
God. And you, so what's funny, Lenny, is yesterday we talked to one of our eye reporters who was also there, and he kind of thought it was over. So he walked out and then heard the Star Spangled Banner playing behind him, and people were telling him, hey, Jimi Hendrix is on the stage, and it's really amazing. And he was pretty much all uh, heading back home at that point. But lucky you were there, right? Well, the thing is that um, I was working radio. I was working on uh, college radio at uh, Northeastern University at the time. And uh, I had already seen a couple of Hendrix shows, so I was really into wanting to see the Jimi Hendrix set, and I was a very, very um, committed photographer. And so I wanted to see the set, and I had already seen 26 incredible concerts that had happened, but I was waiting with one roll of film, and there's no way that I was going to use that roll on anybody else but Jimmy. so I waited and waited and waited. And um, it was uh, Monday morning. I remember very well Monday morning, and there's Jimmy tuning up at 9.30 on Monday morning, or 9.15 or something. Um, the band that came on right before him was Sha Na Na, and uh, you just saw, I just saw a picture of Sha Na Na, and it turns out they got paid a dollar to play that day. Huh. Uh, now, the, the next uh, shot is uh, just a bunch of different shots that happened after he tuned up. He kept playing and playing and playing, and I had 30 six pictures on this one roll. I mean, if you think about digital photography today, I don't think people can imagine like having such a short number of pictures that you'd be able to use. So I knew that Jimmy was going to do something we call the love sign, because I had already seen two shows the year before, and he always went peace and lo uh, love, like this, with a, a single finger, peace and love. And so there's the shot right there, where um, it was actually the 36th shot on my roll. Your I last your last minutes. shot. Yeah, I was up to 35, and I waited 40 minutes because I knew he was going to do that, and I'm the only person that got that shot. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to feel... I mean, I felt really bad about Jimmy passing away, like, less than a year after that uh, happened, really, or around a year later, and... Um, I've never get to see him again. It was it was uh, pretty uh, pretty de depressing. So I actually waited 25 years before I published any of You're these pictures. You're kidding? No, I'm I'm not. I I uh, had had a bad experience earlier. I was 18 years old when I took these pictures. I was a very committed photographer using a Nikromet with a very special uh, old Nikon lens, a 105 millimeter lens. I'm I'm really into the the details because actually right now I work at a place called B&H Photo in uh, New York City and I train people uh, to, t to sell cameras and I train people to use cameras so I'm involved very much in the digital world but I go all the way back to the 19th century technology that we called uh, you know photography with dark rooms and chemicals and all that and um, so doing these pictures having a very limited number of pictures that you could do and being very focused on specifically what I wanted to try to get that that specific day. I mean, there were so many great shows. I mean, I loved when Crosby, Stills and Nash came out and Neil Young was playing electric guitar with Stephen Stills. It was unbelievable. Alvin Lee, 10 years after, unbelievable. Sly and the Family Stone, unbelievable. The Who, you could, you could freak out. I mean, just over and over, so many beautiful visuals and I was very close. But I kept my camera in my van, which was a thousand yards behind the stage. I kept my camera away because I knew how could I not, you know, use all that film for all these other bands. I had to save it for Jimmy because I thought that, that you know, it was just the most important thing for me personally was to get these shots of Jimmy at, at Woodstock, not because he was going to be gone soon, but because um, to me, uh, this was what it was all about, about a, a total commitment to uh, making music and, and just giving people the pleasure of hearing the music. And Jimmy was so giving. I mean, he would, one time he uh, had a taxi, he was picked up by a taxi, um, and he found out that the taxi player was a percussionist, and he was on a way to a session over here at Electric Lady Studios in New York City on 8th Street. And he said, wow, come in, I'm doing a session. And he had the taxi player come in <laughs> and actually play on the tune. I'm not sure if they used that, that track, but the point was that, that Jimmy never thought he was above anyone. He thought he was like everybody was, he was just loving like the whole world, really. And he was such a wonderful person. So I really wanted to catch, you know, that particular uh, show. But nobody really knew if it was ever going to really happen because Jimmy insisted on being last, which was some people think that wasn't a, a great move. I mean, I met uh, this gentleman, Gerardo Velez, who was one of the band of gypsies. Jimmy's band was used to be called, at that point in 1969, it was called 
the experience band with Noel, uh, with uh, Noel Redding and uh, Mitch Mitchell, the, the drummer and the bass player. Noel Redding was the bass player. But Jimmy was originally a bass player himself, and he had some conflicts because every time um, his bass player played, he disagreed very often with the way tunes were played. And when it came to sessions, recording sessions, he used to secretly overdub the uh, bass sections, and it didn't help the, for the band to exist. So the band basically broke up in February, March of 1969, and Jimmy got the contract. I think he got paid the, one of the highest pays, 12000 15000 to do that show. But he had no band. So he put together um, the band of gypsies up in Kingston. He uh, rented a house in Kingston, put together a bunch of percussionists. And then finally, when it got to about two weeks before the show was going to happen at Woodstock, he realized his band was kind of in trouble because they couldn't actually play any of his tunes. They were jamming really well, but they couldn't play Foxy Lady. And then, you know, they couldn't play, uh, you know, uh, Hey Joe, because they were really not a tight band. They were only together a short time. So he brought in uh, Mitch Mitchell, his drummer that he'd been playing with for three years with the Experience Band. And Mitch Mitchell came in and wrote in his book. He just passed away uh, eight months ago, Mitch Mitchell did. But Mitch Mitchell wrote in his book, he said that it was the worst band he had ever heard when he walked into that uh, practice room. And he was the one who really tightened the, the band up. And you can see in one of those shots you showed where Jimmy is up in the air and his uh, jacket is flying around, that he's got eye contact with Mitch Mitchell. He's got eye contact with the drummer. And he also knew, they, the whole band knew, if they were going to play one of the, the real hits, they were going to play Foxy later, they were going to play Hey Joe, they were going to play any of the real hits, that the rest of the band had to stop playing. Just the, the bass player and basically and, and Mitch Mitchell. And um, so it was interesting after having gone through many years of talking to some of the people who were on stage and uh, going through all that, you start learning all the, the different things that happened that led up to the, the shows and things that happened backstage. So, um, you know, it's been a, a, a long uh, road, but um, I'm really glad that you uh, take the interest to, to listen to what I'm having to say today. Well, Lenny Eisenberg, uh, thanks for the stories and thanks for sending in the pictures and happy 40th anniversary of Woodstock to you. Pete Townsend, who was cautioning uh, everybody not to drink the brown acid or something like who was Actually, it? Actually, that was Chip Monk, Chip. who was who was one of yeah. the uh, he's a lighting director, but one of the masters of ceremony. He he was uh, there were lots of announcements about drugs. Don't mm -hmm. take this and do take this and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were. Um, it was one of the predominant themes going on because you had to try and keep things down to a level roar there. Mm -hmm. How many? There was only one death, wasn't there? There were two deaths, Two actually. deaths were there? There was yeah. one drug overdose, and one poor young man was sleeping in a sleeping bag in the mud under a tractor. Someone didn't know he was under there, started up the tractor, and ran over him. So that Ooh, was... I hate it when that happened. But there were more births than deaths. Yes. How many births at Woodstock? Three, was it? Well, Three. you know, that's an interesting question, because nobody has ever found a Woodstock baby. Now, there have been, there've been <laughs> lots of stories about Woodstock babies, but I tried to find them. I talked to people who, for the 10th anniversary, tried to find them. And no one in 20 years has either come forth and said either, I was born at Woodstock, or I gave birth to a child at Woodstock. Now, I know that from the pictures that there were de definitely some, some women there who were in their ninth and a half month. More, yeah, let's, speaking of pictures, let's take a look we at a couple, a couple of shots here that you brought with us uh, that Leonard took uh, back 20 years ago. Uh, what, what are we seeing here? This is uh, 